Well, welcome to everyone. It's, it is indeed a wonderful way to start the week. Uh, we were in high summer yesterday and now it's uh, raining and a bit cool here in Bonvo, but <clears throat> that's just the weather. But um, well, I was very struck by the, and I hope you're all well. It's, it's uh, I think uh, it strikes me more and more uh, as I see the network of online meditation groups and the support that's coming through the, the new website. Um, it seems to me what, one of the things that the spirit is doing during this time is building up a contemplative infrastructure, a contemplative consciousness. It's not a political force. It's not a, you know, an action group in that sense, but <clears throat> I think it is essential if we are to um, try to learn our lessons from this time and we don't have a lot of inspired leadership in, on the political stage. So it's very vital that there is a growing body of, of living wisdom at the grassroots and you know, spread throughout the whole of, uh, whole of society and internationally and interculturally. And uh, in some way that we can't really explain, I, I feel this, there is this, growth and and strengthening of a, of a wisdom consciousness uh, in in, the, in in people globally through through the practice and by coming together it becomes more conscious and more more real and it's one of the paradoxes of course that we are <clears throat> facing in this time that it's a it's a chaotic and uncertain and uh, the economic uh, news is not good and yet, at the same time, and of course, there's there's a, there's a lot of a lot of suffering and loss. And yet, at the same time, I I hear and I think I can understand, and I'm sure you do. There is a growing peace and a sense of joy. And it uh, this is a paradox. This is this is not uh, an explanation, and it's not a, <clears throat> it's not a, just a consolation. It's, a, it's actually a challenge to us to be able to hold these two experiences of, of grief and uncertainty and on the one hand and joy and hope on the other. And wisdom is about holding these apparent contradictions uh, together and just trusting that they are both authentic. Um, and I was, I was struck by the reading uh, from Father John, the story of Shiva and, uh, and the, um, the, 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 the little old man who was so happy that he was guaranteed liberation after 1,000 uh, new, new births. And it, I remember actually Father John telling that story uh, in one of the... I think the Tuesday meditation group we had in, in Montreal um, and the, 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 the mood or the, 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 the humor and the, the, the sort of insight that came, joyful insight that came uh, into consciousness as he told that story and people, people got the point. And we need to be shocked sometimes by humor, for example. These, these are sad times, but we, we also need humor. We need to be able to, to see the joy that, that is bursting through, coming through inevitably through, through the, the ground of being, even into difficult and painful circumstances. And that paradox always creates humor and, and this quality of, of humor not being too pompous or too serious or, or you know, or, or too solemn is one of the qualities of, of uh, becoming a saint in the Catholic Church, uh, hilaritas. If you don't have a, the ability to laugh, you're just focusing upon 
the, the suffering and the pain and the, and the, and the, the darkness, uh, you, you haven't really opened up in every part of yourself to the, to the presence and the, the, the action of God. And um, so paradox, the apparent contradictions of life that we find difficult rationally to, uh, to hold in balance, but these are essential to the growth of wisdom and wisdom is in great need today. And I was thinking of that precisely when um, I read in the diaries of Etty Hillison recently um, Etty Hillison, I'm sure many of you will know, was a young Jewish woman in Holland in the 1940s. And the uh, Nazis began to round up the Jews. She was not a religious Jew at that time. Um, they were rounding them up to, for transportation to the death camps. Uh, so not, uh, not a very joyful time. And in her diaries, though, she shows that it was during this period of great darkness and, 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 and fear and, 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 and oppression that she found that well of life in herself that she eventually accepted had to be called God. There was no other word for it. And then as she struggled with that discovery which she couldn't put a name on really. Uh, it led her one day in her bathroom uh, to fall to her knees and pray, which is not what a Jew does when they pray. Uh, but she just felt th this was the, the next thing she had to do and to find the stillness and silence which, which that well of love that she was finding in herself uh, demanded. And at the same time as she was having this mystical awakening, she was running from one detention center to another with messages, little packages of food. Um, and she was talking to the families who were, who had only one thing that, that they felt they could do. Many of them felt the only thing they could do in their powerless condition was to hate, to hate the Germans for what they were doing. And uh, Etty would, would, would challenge that, and just as Simone Weil did, that, that this is not our response. This is not how we can and should response to, respond to, uh, to darkness or suffering or evil, even evil in its, in its darkest forms. But that didn't mean that she felt joyful all the time. One of her entries, uh, she said, I feel a deep, dark and total despair today. And she said, I just have to deal with it. I just have to deal with it. And I mean, for, for the, those of you who know the desert tradition uh, of, of monasticism, will will recognize what um, a profound uh, example that is of of echadia which is a form of discouragement and darkness and giving up hope that that echadia could be controlled that that it didn't have to overwhelm us and there was another level of knowledge and experience and hope within herself that could face that dark force of despair and just say it's there and I have to deal with it and now I have to go out and do my my work so and there's a, a little entry where she 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 writes this I wrote it down I was going to put it in the newsletter if I ever get to write the newsletter she said today's real experience was the magnolia in the corner of Tilda's room, whose mysterious beauty almost scared me stiff. I stood open-mouthed for nearly five minutes as if nailed to the floor. 
So she was capable of particularly flowers had this effect on her as she, as she uh, coped with the situation. Uh, and she spoke once about uh, a large bunch of roses that she bought uh, on, the on her way home. And she was so delighted with these roses. She said, they are just as real as all the misery I witness every day. So I, I mentioned that because those are very real, very sort of vivid examples of living with paradox. And I don't think our situation socially, globally, financially, politically, and so on is going to improve very rapidly. We hope that it will lead to some healthier, more just, and more intelligent ways of living and ways of constructing our economy and so on. We hope that wisdom will enable us to improve the way we've been living. It's clearly a wake up call uh, showing us how unsustainable our, our lifestyle globally has become. So we hope if there is enough wisdom in the system that uh, we will, and, and good leaders come to the fore, then we will be able to, to correct at least some of the worst errors in, in our uh, global culture and global institutions. But I don't think that's going to happen immediately. So we, we need to, and, and I think contemplatives are never more necessary than in a time like this. If we look at the 14th century in uh, England, which was a very difficult I mean, uh, century, it was riven by wars, the Hundred Years' War with France, uh, social upheaval, the um, Peasants' Revolt, and, uh, and of course, the, the, the Black Death, which uh, killed off more than, uh, more than a quarter of the population and would come back in waves. So not, a, not, not an ideal century by any means, but similar to our own 20th century, perhaps. And yet it was during this time that the great mystical school of English Christianity uh, awakened with, with teachers like Julian of Norwich and Richard Roll and uh, uh, the Cloud of Unknowing and so on. Uh, one of our oblates, uh, Stefan Reynolds, is, is doing a, a series of, of presentations uh, on, the, uh, on Julian and on the cloud um, on the Contemplative Path website. I hope you get a chance to look at those. And also, and yet, so out of this uh, dark century came this, just one, so somebody at the door. Hello? No, I'm, I'm just on, on a call. Okay. So, um, sorry. So, um, so out of this sort of dark century came came this this flowering of hope and and of, of of deep wisdom welling up through individuals and small communities. And I think that's how we have to see see our work uh, today. And these networks of online meditation groups and of course our community spread around the world. Thanks to this technology, we're able to really spread another kind of virus. And, and a, a, a virus of hope and a virus of wisdom. And this isn't a political matter, as I said, or um, it's not an activist uh, cause, but it will find expression and it will affect the practical decisions and policies that, that will, we hope, get us out of this 
situation and into a better world. The French, uh, our French community here in uh, here in, in, in France have been preparing a seminar on the environment, contemplative approach to the ecological crisis. And because of the shutdown, we weren't able to have it here at Bonveau, but, we, but they're very determined to go ahead uh, with it online this year and next year, we hope to do it in, in person. And um, you can see this flow of consciousness between deep faithful contemplation and action doing what we can do and each of us can do something with a word with a gesture with a contribution of some kind to to a practical uh, healing and restorative work each of us can make some contribution at the practical level as well but what we're seeing i think is the is the power of the contemplative consciousness and the need for this contemplative consciousness to provide us with the wisdom to make the right decisions and put the right actions into place. So we are in a time of, uh, of paradox, as I said, and uh, we need to keep our spirits um, buoyant and we need to be able, as Father John uh, understood and as, as the great contemplatives throughout history have understood, we need to keep joyful and to, and to allow that joy, authentic joy, not just escapist fun, but the authentic joy that wells up in us inevitably through the work of contemplation, but to allow that out. And um, one of the things that uh, Sarah Bachelard's uh, talks struck me uh, with uh, the next one is tomorrow. I, if you haven't watched any of them yet, her, her talks are, are really excellent and she's a wonderful, a wonderful uh, teacher in our community. Um, but one of the things that struck me uh, as I reflected on her talk last week was this quality of surprise. The sign of true faith is that we allow ourselves to be surprised. We don't know it all. We can live with uncertainty and we can be surprised by the way in which the life of the spirit grows in us and develops the virtues. She was talking last week about the three theological virtues of faith, hope and charity which she describes as gifts. Grace, of course, traditionally, these are called the, the gifts of the spirit. Uh, these aren't things we earn, but they're presents, gifts to us. And a good gift always comes as a surprise. Of course, then we have to receive it. We have to allow it to, to, to touch us and to deepen the relationship between ourselves and the person giving us the gift. That's the ritual of, of giving and receiving. But it's always going to take us by surprise. And that's one of the qualities of a child, of course, why we need to become more childlike so that we recover this capacity for spontaneous receptivity. We can receive this gift and always be surprised by it. It never becomes stale. And this is the way to deal with despair or darkness or depression or all of the natural responses that we're likely to have uh, from time to time in, in, a, in, in life and in a time like this especially. So to keep open the door of our heart to allow this gift of hope and faith and love to continue to take us by surprise so that like Etty, even when things are, are really looking quite terrible and hopeless, we can be surprised by joy, surprised by hope, even when we feel a bit desperate, and surprised by faith, even when we begin to, uh, to doubt. So 
I think our, our weekly gathering and uh, like many of the uh, gatherings of meditators uh, in this great contemplative network that's, that's growing, deep contemplative network, I think um, we are part of that in some way, part of that work of God in this difficult and painful time. And thank you all for contributing to it and, and being such an inspiring group.